Next up for Founder Stories, we have a conversation between Path founder and early Facebook employee Dave Marin and TechCrunch managing editor Peter Hoff. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, just real quick, Dave, what kind of socks are you wearing? <laughs> Anything what fancy? kind of socks? No, nothing fancy today. Yeah, no, neither am I. <coughs> um, so let's uh, let's just get started. You know, when Path relaunched with 2.0, you know, you saw a very sudden uptick in downloads and users. Have you been able to maintain that momentum? Yeah, certainly. We've uh, we've actually seen an increase um, even just in the last couple of months uh, in the United States. We've had a really nice uptake. Uh, a lot of the early growth that we were experiencing after 2.0 is mostly in Japan and Korea. Uh, China is actually our number two country now, um, which has been a surprise to us and something that we've been learning a lot about. But um, just in the last few months, um, the United States has actually been uh, growing in kind of these nice uh, metro pockets, which has been nice. Yeah. Uh, how many downloads have you had to date? Uh, we're above three million, but we haven't yeah. announced uh, beyond that. Uh, okay. And uh, we'll about, have news on that soon. And about how many active users? Uh, we, our active user rate, uh, our MAU tends to be around 50% um, of our uh, total install base, yep. which is particularly exciting for us because we tend to focus on uh, engagement over all else. And so, uh, you know, having half of our user base uh, engaged is really exciting for us. Okay. So, you know, you guys with Path 2.0, I believe you went from 50 uh, friends, I guess, to 150, correct? Yep. So what's the sort of average connections for each active user? Uh, for active users, we, uh, it hovers right around 40, actually, which um, was kind of an interesting piece of kind of uh, anthropological learning that we had from, uh, from doing the, you know, that switch, was that when we had it set at 50, uh, the number of user or the number of friends that people had tended to be around 10 or 15, which is actually the sort of inner inner circle in Dunbar's uh, theories. And as we moved it to 150, people actually then net out at the next ring out, which is you know, around 50. So we actually kind of achieved the, uh, the, the network that we desired. We kind of believe that 50 is the perfect network. And so. OK. So would you say that path is successful? Yeah, I mean, we see constant continuing growth. Uh, the uh, users uh, are more excited than they've ever been. Uh, and um, you know we're not slowing down, so that that to us means success. Okay. So right now your sole means of revenue is driven through in-app purchases of photo filters, right? Yep. Um, what's been the most popular type of content so far? The most popular type of what? Content. Is it videos or is it photos? Ah, uh, it's photos for yeah. sure. Um, video tends to be pretty hard to. Uh, Deliver just because of the speed of the network and you know a variety of different things. We've tried some things to you know increase the the mix, but uh, basically it's photos, uh, thoughts, which we call them, and then uh, sleep is actually has been our third most uh, our third most popular type of content. But uh, music just passed sleep in the last month, so we're really? uh, we're excited about that. I never really use the sleep or awake thing. Yeah, it's surprising. It's one of those things where uh, down to the week before we released it. I was considering cutting the feature entirely just because it seemed like you know, we were really interested in this sort of quantified self journaling aspect of Path. And we wanted to add something that was a deeply personal type of content. And sleep is one of those things. Um, and we also kind of wanted to point towards the, uh, the fact that mobile is kind of the, the future and where everything is going. And in the mobile world, you're not online or offline. You're just asleep or awake. Right. And so, uh, we decided to put sleep in, and we thought you know, people might like it, but we never would have ex expected that it would be the third most popular type of content on the network for, for a long period of time. So where do you think mobile is now compared to a year ago? Well, uh, I can tell you uh, from a, just from a sheer data standpoint, um, a year ago when we launched uh, Path 1.0, we were getting the majority of our new platform requests were for BlackBerry, um, which is really interesting. Yeah. And today, obviously, that's uh, diminished quite significantly. Um, we're about 70-30 Android and, or iOS Android now. Um, and that's been, Android's been slowly increasing as a, as a, you know, as a component of our uh, growth. And so um, I think that the, the really surprising thing that we spend a lot of time thinking about is that 
There's an argument that the PC uh, as a concept, as a product in the world, um, you can actually make an argument that it, it was a failure. Um, you know, there's about 1.5 billion PCs in the world if you look at Mary Meeker's last internet report. Um, and there's about the same number of landline telephones. And the interesting thing is today there are, you know, over 5 billion mobile subscribers in the world. And there's our, we're already peaking on about a billion mobile phones. And obviously we're adding, you know, tens to hundreds of millions a month. Um, and so the mobile phone is actually, or the mobile device, is actually the most successful technology platform in history. And we're starting to see that in spades this year, whereas last year there was still some debate that that was true. And so, you know, it's, it's fascinating to see that there are more, more people with mobile devices in the world with toothbrushes. There's more people with mobile devices in the world than, you know, the computer by a factor of four. So, um, you know, it truly is a universal technology. It's truly the first computer that made it to everyone. And that's a, you know, to me that I get up every morning and I'm more excited every single day just because, you know, we finally have a computer that's in every person's hand, not just on every person's desk. Right. So I think it's safe to say that um, if you take a look at Apple and Microsoft and Google and what they're doing, both in terms of their mobile sort of initiatives and desktops, you know, those things are starting to merge, right? You have Windows Phone 8 with Windows 8, uh, iOS and OS X and, and Android and, and Chrome. So you know, there's that platform race. So when does Path, I guess, sort of, when do you say to yourself, do we go to the web? Do we make a tablet app? I think that uh, obviously Android and iPhone are great platforms today. Um, we pay a lot of attention to Windows. Um, it's clearly moving a little bit faster than I think the general conversation will uh, give it credit for. Um, we think probably end of this year, early next year, we'll probably start thinking more about Windows, Windows Phone, but we're certainly bullish on it. Um, as far as tablets go, clearly it's, you know, uh, it's time. So it's something we're thinking a lot about. But um, when we go to a new platform, we actually try to approach that platform with a beginner's mind. So we really try to approach it in a way that uh, gives respect to the platform from a design perspective. Um, so if you look at what we released uh, in our 2.5 release for Android, we actually went and we followed the human interface guidelines for Jelly Bean and we completely redid the, the interface for uh, the platform so that it's, it's less of Path's opinion and more of Path's opinion on top of the Android opinion. Um, and so when we start thinking about tablets, uh, we'll probably do it that way. But it's something that we're still thinking about and we haven't really started on. OK. Um, let's talk about privacy for a second. Uh, now, this isn't anything specific to Path, but I've noticed that you, users can check in to locations with other people. Um, and you know, we both know that as long as you don't share that out to Twitter or Facebook, that's pretty self-contained. And the other user that you check in with is never really notified of that check-in, right? Yep. But I think as a whole, how do you stop people? Or at what point do you say, well, we don't really want you to share that on Twitter or Facebook because you're sort of, you know, you're kind of cheating and, and you're not really with that person? Well, we think about privacy in terms of control. Uh, it's, sort of, it's one of our core values at Path. And so you see this play out in subtle details in the product. So for example, you're the only person that can contribute to your path. Uh, when you tag someone, it doesn't put that piece of content into their path and share it with their friends. And so we do that because we try to prioritize this idea that as a person, you sort of control your expression on the network and nobody else should, right? And so. Uh, on path, you can kind of expect that you're always in control and that only people, people will only see the things that you share uh, uh, with your friends. And so um, as far as when content is syndicated to other networks, we've found that one of the, people, one of the things that people love about path is this all-in-one experience where you can treat path as sort of your home. You know, we use this metaphor that path is like the home inside of Facebook City or Twitter's sort of information news network. And we really see it as that. So, you know, when you think about your home, you can be inside your home and you can pick up the phone and call out and do something, you know, talk to anyone. You can, leave, you can walk out your door. And all of these things are sort of APIs to the, re the real world. And when you go outside, you're under a different set of rules than when you are inside your house. And so we kind of treat it that way, where when we package up a piece of content and send it off into another network, we, we don't try to do anything fancy with it. We don't try to impose our views. Uh, you know, we put it into the Facebook open graph exactly as the user would expect it. Um, we put it out onto Twitter exactly as the user would expect it. 
uh, and, and that's something that, uh, you know, we try to be really, really focused on the user so that we're doing exactly what they would expect under the rules of that network. So again, it's all about control. So sort of sh shifting gears, uh, Twitter recently has fussed with their API and they've cut off Tumblr, um, I think for very obvious reasons. Um, you know, there's something about their interest graph that they've built over the years and, you know, you kind of want to keep that um, close to the chest. But when does content become proprietary? And by that I mean, will you ever stop your users from being able to share their check-ins or what they're listening to or movies that they're watching? We will never stop the user from doing what they want to do with their data. Again, we, we fundamentally believe that users, the user, truly the user, should always be in control of their data. So if it's you know, the question of, I'd like to take this post and syndicate it over to Twitter, or I'd like to get my data out of path and take it somewhere else, you know, these are all things that we believe in, and we, we are slowly building out different tools that sort of align with that value. Um, as far as the, you know, what's happening with the other platforms, you know, I, I spent a bunch of years working on the Facebook platform, um, and we, we, we learned a lot over the years just how to sort of govern the platform. Um, I used to read a lot of uh, economics books <laughs> instead of technology books um, in terms of uh, uh, thinking about how to govern a, you know, a system in, in sort of the most equitable way. Um, and I think that Twitter's in a hard place. Um, you know, they, they clearly have some opinions and they, ha and they have other places where they want to, you know, uh, let the ecosystem flourish. But, you know, I think Reed said in the last, last talk that they started out in a place where there weren't very many rules. And so to sort of start exerting an opinion over time is, is actually pretty hard. And so I, I don't envy, envy their position, but um, I, I think they're trying to do it with the, with the right you know, incentives in mind. But yeah. we'll see how it plays out. Um, so I'm going to uh, recite a quote from you, or not from you, but from Matt Mullenweg. He said that if you're not embarrassed when you ship your first version, you waited too long. So I think that sort of addresses the two different ways of building a startup these days is, do we go super fast or do we go down a, a more slow growth model? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that um, one of the most interesting things playing out in the market today is this, uh, there really is kind of a, a, a dichotomy in terms of how people think about building these companies. You can, you can sort of take the, the fast growth model where, uh, you know, the, the, and you hear that referred to as a variety of different things, whether it's fast iteration, lean startup, you know, uh, you can go that model and you can sort of pivot, I think of it as day trading with your startup strategy. Uh, and you can, uh, sometimes, it's very risky, sometimes you can hit it, right? And you can uh, create a fast growth curve and ride that uh, to the, the equitable outcome. Um, the other way you can think about things is to really double down on a long-term strategy and uh, choose to do something that uh, perhaps has business fundamentals being played out much earlier. You know, whether it's uh, a, a company like Path or one like LinkedIn, um, you look at these companies and you know they started experimenting with revenue much earlier on. Uh, they took an opinion as to you know in terms of how to build the graph of people out that they wanted to sort of build out. So for us, we've been really focused on family first, uh, close friends, uh, a distant second. For LinkedIn, you know they they sort of spent a lot of time and still to this day, when you connect with someone, they ask you, how do you know this person? Should you be connected to this person? And so by virtue of doing that, you end up building a much longer term business um, that grows much more slowly and you, you sort of end up you know, dealing with all the consequences of that. Now there's nothing wrong with doing it one way or the other. I think what's dangerous is to be somewhere in the middle. Um, and I think it's important to choose which way you do it uh, because they both can be risky. You know, in, the, in the slow growth model you end up uh, you know, going through a lot of emotional ups and downs, you know, the, the things that everybody uh, building a company go through, but you go through them on much longer time horizons and, um, the, you know, uh, and you have to really focus on fundamentals. Uh, on this side, it's much easier to, you know, build the, uh, build the company quickly, uh, really put the poor gas on the fire. And so uh, both, both have their, you know, pros and cons. And so I think what's more important is to know which one you're doing. Yep. Uh, so going back to PATH, I think since 2.0, you guys have been very sort of design driven and given your Apple background, um, what is the design philosophy at PATH? 
Well, we spend a ton of time thinking about interface uh, breakthroughs. Um, we, and I, I suppose our design philosophy above all is that we're design driven. Um, we're incredibly focused on simplicity and focus. And so, uh, you know, we take very careful uh, consideration into everything that we do and we're, we're sort of willing to spend, I think, a longer period of time uh, on an interface uh, uh, in order to get to the right level of simplicity. You know, true simplicity takes a long time. Uh, it's not something you can produce over a weekend. Um, it's something that takes months. You know, you have to sort of get to a point of simplicity where uh, it almost, the interface almost feels inevitable. It almost feels uh, so simple that you ask yourself, this is too easy, it can't be just that, right? Um, and th this is kind of one of the things that we did uh, with, the, with the last interface that we released for Path 2. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do we create a menu that enables people to contribute multiple different types of content, um, is delightful to use, is very simple, doesn't have much cognitive overhead. Uh, and you know, it took us about 20 iterations and over six months of just focusing on a single interface to make that breakthrough. And so um, we spend a lot of time in search of those breakthroughs. Uh, and um, I think that that's one of the most important things uh, that creates value is sort of thinking about a new way for humans to interface with software. I mean, aside from the radial menu, which I could probably play with for hours on end, uh, you guys did a really clever thing by integrating Nike Plus, right? And just that simple little interaction of getting the two apps to talk to each other. Um, no one else has really done that, or I, maybe I don't even know if they've thought about it. But, um, but there has been a little bit of backlash from that, I think. I think some people are getting a little bit annoyed that people's fuel scores and you know, whatever other messages you get on path, because you expect Path to be very sort of curated, right? You're only sharing very specific things. So, I mean, how do you address that? Are you going to allow users to sort of like scale that back a little bit? We're definitely hearing that. Um, and one of the other interface uh, things that we released with 2.0 was this idea of ambient updates. Um, and we've, we've focused a lot on sort of using, uh, you know, machine learning and AI we kind of say that AI is the new UI. Um, and we kind of try to figure out ways that we can contribute to your path in a way that's smart, that makes sense, that adds value to not just the journal of your life uh, that is your path, but also is something that would produce um, conversation and interaction with the people that are close to you. Um, and the, uh, the, the running, actually, integration that we've done has been, you know, stratospherically successful on all metrics. Um, you know, we, we, see more, we see people uh, sending us emails, tweeting about it, that they're running more, they're running, they're not, not only are they running more, they're running faster, running longer, they're more inspired to, you know, chase their fitness goals. Um, it's created a conversation for them around this thing that they do every day for an hour, right? Um, with the fuel band, uh, it's kind of a new thing. You know, we tried to take the, uh, the data that comes from the fuel band uh, and we overlaid it with our own interface and made it possible for you to touch the curve. And we tried to make an experience where the two, the two experiences and the two data streams together uh, made a better experience for both Nike and Path users. Um, but I think we're very much in V1. You know, we're hearing from people that uh, they don't like the automatic nature of it, that they want things that are uh, more curated. I don't think these are things that we necessarily expected. And so it's one of those things where we're, we're working hand in hand with Nike. Um, to, to, uh, to come up with better ways of thinking about this, to, to push the ball forward. Um, and I think to Nike's credit, they've, you know, they've really created a new, you know, sort of a, a new mobile device that, you know, is, is, you know, another computer that I'm carrying on me every single day, right? Which, which is something that didn't exist before. And so we're, we're, to say we're in the early innings of how sensors and mobile devices work together, I think would be an understatement. Uh, Nike, uh, Jawbone and the Up, you know, they're really kind of the first two real devices that are fashion forward enough and, um, you know, have enough utility that people are willing to put them on their wrist. Yeah. So we've got about a minute left. Um, so Dave, you occasionally sort of invest, so is there anything that you're seeing now that you're, that's piquing your interest or do you see any trends? Um, I think that uh, this trend towards well, there's uh, one trend which is kind of bringing the efficiency of capital markets to a variety of different 
uh, experiences, whether it's Uber or what TaskRabbit's doing or these type of things where you're sort of taking uh, under-leveraged resources or pools of resources or under-leveraged time and, you know, uh, adding efficiency there. I think, obviously, we in the internet business can add a lot of amazing, uh, you know, experiences there. Um, the other thing I'm pretty excited about is I kind of believe that we're hitting this Cambrian moment where uh, we've gone from, you know, uh, uh, carrying one computer for a really long period of time, and now we're carrying multiple computers. So whether it's your iPad and your iPhone and your, uh, uh, jo you know, your job on up on your wrist, or you know what Google's doing with glasses, um, uh, I think that there's an inc incredible opportunity around sort of the just the amount of data that's being generated by all these different computers and kind of giving people an understanding of their life uh, in order to help them make better decisions and add utility. Um, I think that that's uh, going to be a really incredibly interesting trend, um, obviously bound by things like battery life and uh, you know, what we can do with the technology, but there's a lot of innovation going on there from the software side. There's a lot of people doing interesting things with hardware, whether you look at Kickstarter and see all these watches. And yeah. you know, there's, there's clearly a, a we're, we're experiencing a moment now where it's an explosion of the number of computers that we're, we're carrying. And so I think that, that that's a really fundamental thing. Uh, one last question. Uh, when is Path 3.0 coming? <laughs> uh, we like to keep that close to the vest, so uh, but we'll be sure to share it with you guys when we're when we're ready. All right, thanks, Dave. Thank you.